Daniel chapter 1. Isn't that tremendous? All struck wonder. We're going to be going through the book of Daniel. We're going to be starting that this morning. And you talk about someone with all struck wonder. When Nebuchadnezzar looked in the fiery furnace and seen four, <laughs> he said that we not put three. That's all struck wonder. And um, we need to have that all struck wonder for our God who is faithful and who is true. Our kids are going over. As you're finding your place in Daniel chapter 1, <clears throat> we are going to be, um, this is grief share. Grief share if you have lost uh, a loved one or been through something traumatic or, um, you know, maybe a, a divorce or anything that's happened in your life. It'll be coming up in September. It's going to run 13 weeks, September 12th through December the 5th. It will be every Tuesday night uh, right here on our campus. And uh, there's some information in the back of something that maybe you have, you know, uh, haven't had help in, in years. It's had to be something that's just immediate, but uh, grief share. So it's where you get together and, and let the word of the Lord and other folks that's been through help minister uh, and take you through some hardships in life. And so uh, there's information on the back with that. If you're interested in that, our concert's coming up uh, with uh, the Milan Hayes Family Celebration. That's in a few weeks. So there's information in the back about that as well. The book of Daniel, verse number one. <clears throat> as we start this book, Daniel's an interesting book. Daniel's a, a, a book that's got, I think, some of the most known uh, stories uh, in the Old Testament. But however, it's got some of the most unknown stuff as well. Let me break the book down just a little bit for you. Then I'll read a few verses. Now, this morning may sound a little bit like a history lesson. But keep in mind, uh, church, we don't want to just be surface people. We want to go deep into the Scripture, amen? We want to be people that's got some depth that we're not just surface. And so when we dive into the Word of the Lord, I'm doing this not because I want to impress with history and all that. Guard. I'm not doing that. But putting the Bible and setting the stage helps bring these pages to life because we're dealing with actual history. These are individuals. These are people. Uh, we've got the story of Daniel and extra-biblical uh, sources with Nebuchadnezzar and and the other individuals that's dealt with this. And so when we understand its setting, you can help bring to life its truths. And so it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Now we know to the, uh, the stela of Cyrus, we also know through some Babylonian stellas that this took place in around 589. The besieging starts, takes place about 30 months, and it fell. Jerusalem fell to Babylon in 586 B.C. But to really make this make sense, we'd go right on through this and just read where it was just a country that's bigger than the others, and it happens in history, and world history, that here this particular uh, nation, it's on the rise, it's got two million soldiers, and it's coming against this uh, little old nation that has, you know, 150,000 soldiers, it makes sense. However, until you get to verse number two, <laughs> when it says that the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, over into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if we flip that around and that God gave Nebuchadnezzar over into the hands of the king of Judah, we'd be having a shouting service this morning, right? Our God is faithful and he comes through. But however, this is a, uh, a devastating loss. <clears throat> completely destroyed. It's going to completely level. Now, a little bit of the history on this is two things I got to Not only king of Judah, but the king of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar II, and who is he? So let me just give you a brief history lesson. And then I'm going to read the first seven verses and then give you some practical points that we're going to take. I'm going to love diving into this book. The book of Daniel is divided in 
The first six chapters, it seems like it's a narrative about Daniel. Daniel's in the third person. It's where you find where people go to and preach out of Daniel the most, is those first six chapters. But then the narrative goes in ch uh, chapter 7 through 12, it changes. Now the uh, narrative becomes I, Daniel. Whereas the first six chapters is talking about things that had happened. It's a historical point of Daniel's life while in exile, 70 years of the first six chapters. It's a 70-year history of a man named Daniel when he was taken around 15 years old and exiled out of Jerusalem, never to return to go and there exceed in Babylon. Those 70 years is chronicled for us in the first six years. So it's things that happened in the past. However, chapter 7 through 12 is things that's yet to happen. Many of the things that's yet to happen is prophetic in its sense. Matter of fact, Daniel chapter 11 is the uh, 200 points of history that it chronicles to a point in Daniel chapter 11. And so it's prophetic and it brings things in that yet has come. Some of it's happened, most of it has not. And so we're going to get into some things and tackle that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Let's back up and let me start with Abraham. It's going to go real quick. Let me give you some Israeli history. There was no Israel. It was just folk. God, in his sovereignty, decided to go to an Iranian uh, living in a place called Ur, modern-day uh, Iran, Iraq, right in that area. And his name was Abraham, and, and God of glory appeared unto him. We looked at that last week. You can talk to your blue in the face, but until God opens a man or a woman's eyes, they will walk in blindness. And God opened his eyes, <clears throat> called him to leave that country into a place. Abram leaves. Let me fast forward. The promise then goes to Isaac and Isaac to Jacob. I'm going to make you a nation. God is setting the tone to buy back humanity from sin. That's the whole reason uh, of this calling. God was engaging in redemptive history. Man had, God created Adam there in the garden, put him in a perfect environment. There Adam and Eve is in a perfect environment. Let me tell you the uh, the tricks of Satan is real, and the human nature is real. And they're in his innocence. Only one thing. Now, we think we're pretty good folk. If I tell you just one thing you couldn't do, you said, I'm going to be good with that. Only one thing, but who but Satan can go in and make God look very restrictive? <laughs> Satan went in and had Adam and Eve believing that God's trying to keep them from all fun and all life and all of that. That's how this dude, Satan is so real that he was able to trick a third of the angels that was in the very presence of God. What a master deceiver that he is. And so he come in and said, yeah, uh, God's just trying to keep you from some stuff. Man fell. It was man who stepped outside and he fell. It is God who's making the initiative to bring man back into fellowship with himself. And this uh, redemptive story starts with God calling a man. Why? Because he needed a, a nation that you're going to chronicle. And God done it slow of 2,600 years of history and used prophecy that when Jesus rose on the scene, he didn't just come out of nowhere. The prophets for 2,000 years were speaking of him coming. See, he'd done this methodically, that when Jesus came on the scene, it seemed that the nation should have received him, the world should have received him, due to the whole backstory leading up. But we've seen that they rejected him. So God calls Abraham for a purpose. I'm going to take you into a large family, to a large nation. And out of that's going to come the Messiah that shall bring redemption for all of humanity. So there was a promise that was given that followed Abraham and then Isaac and then uh, Isaac's son Jacob. And it seemed to follow. It went, yes, into Judah, but we got to go to the story of Joseph. Joseph was the one that was sold. Joseph being a picture of some things, and he was sold as a 17-year-old boy. And he goes down into Egypt, and God prepared in Egypt... 400 years of bondage to take a large family into a mighty nation. They came out of Egypt being over 2 million strong. As they come out of Egypt, 
Moses led them out. You know the stories we chronicle in God's people as they were delivered out. God is now going to show that nation some truths about him. Took him to the Sinai Peninsula, to Mount Sinai, and there was given the law of God and the various things about God. And he's taking his people now into a land. But we see that Moses didn't take them in, but Joshua, his successor, took them into the promised land where they are 400 years fast forward. You went through Joshua, the end of his life, and then chronicling what is known as the time of the judges, where it was just in various different tribal leaders. There's tribal leaders come at the conclusion of Samson. They said, we want to be like other nations. And here we see the kingdom years that arise. They go to the spoken prophet of the nation named Samuel. And go to Samuel and say, we want to be like the other nations. We want a king. And so they asked for a king. And God gave them a king. The first king was named Saul. He reigns for 40 years. It was united underneath his leadership. Saul's whole point is don't judge a book by its cover. Just because he was about six foot five and strong don't mean he had the heart of a king. And God raised up a man after his own heart. Here comes David. So David comes in. It's a different dynasty. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. There's 12 tribes. The tribe of Benjamin was where Saul was from. But God made a pact and a covenant that the Yeshua, the Messiah, will come to the tribe of Judah. And God went and called out of the tribe of Judah... David. And here David comes and was the most noted king of all of Israeli history. But there he reigns for 40 years. He dies. His son Solomon reigns for 40 years. When he dies, of course, humanity gets in there. Taxes is levied. And the people is saying, listen to Solomon's son. His name was Rehoboam. If you will just lower the levy, we will serve you as we did your father. Solomon, or Rehoboam, gets the advice of his peers rather than the wisdom counsel of the advisors set before him. And there he raises the taxes. Now we have civil war. And what you had is now the kingdom is divided into two different kingdoms, known as the north or south. The northern kingdom takes ten tribes. They go into Egypt and get an arch enemy of Solomon by a man named Jeroboam. They bring Jeroboam, establish him king. They make the capital Samaria. Ten of the tribes get him behind uh, him as king. And now it's known in the Bible as the the kings of Israel. But really the kings of Israel is the northern tribes that is following this man Rehoboam. And its dynasties go. There's no good kings that the Bible says that that man done that which is right. None of them come from the kings of Israel. You find this history in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, through all of its years. It lasted about 209 years. It ended in the Assyrians coming in 722 B.C. and taking out Israel. However, Benjamin and Judah, those two tribes, followed the descendants of David. And they remain there in Jerusalem as its capital, but small in number. They lasted to 586. What we are seeing here is the end of the nation of, or the kingdom of Judah, the southern one. So we're coming to a conclusion of that with Jehoiakim. He's the last king. He's a puppet king. His uncle will be set as a vassal king, a Nebuchadnezzar, his name's Zedekiah. It's the last two kings. We're down to just a few years left. Now, what had been happening the previous 40 years in Jerusalem is Jerusalem had tasted idolatry, and they got caught up in what is known as Baal worship. And so they had left God. Remember, when it comes to nation, it doesn't matter how many, how many and how big of a nation comes against Israel. If God is back in them, they win. Us and God is the majority. We always win when we're trusting God. And so here's a nation that had left God. Read the book of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is laying out, this is what is coming. Matter of fact, it's prophetic that Nebuchadnezzar was going to do this. Jeremiah 27, I'll give you that. Read the first 10 verses. And verse number 6 says that Nebuchadnezzar, he was not even king yet. 
wasn't even born yet. And Jeremiah is saying that Nebuchadnezzar is going to march down and take this city. And the reason is, is not because they're stronger, but it's because you have left your God. It's because you had left the principles of God. You had left the whole point of why we had called you into to being a nation. That there is purpose behind the calling of God. And so this is this Jehoiakim. Now, let's look at Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was born around 630 B.C. He was born to Nabonidus Pleaser, who was the king of Babylon. Babylon has not reached its status since Hammurabi. Hammurabi was the great king of Babylon. He tried to restore Babel. Nebuchadnezzar is going to try to do the same things. Well, let's fast forward. He becomes, and he's established what's called the Chaldean dynasty in Babylon. He begins to build it right on both sides of the Euphrates rivers, runs right through uh, Babylon. Babylon's going to be known as, in the Bible, is a system that is an antithesis to the Christian faith and to its principles. But here it is a literal city in modern-day Iraq, and here Nebuchadnezzar is going to come. Now, he was 24 years old, and he is doing some campaigning in the Middle East, marching down on Egypt. Really, what uh, Nebuchadnezzar was after in around 603 was to take Egypt out. While he was there, he swung by the Levant, or Israel. He said, let me go take a look at Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot here that I'm trying not to unpack and bore you out. (laughs) All right, I don't want you to feel like you're in a history lesson and history class, but really you are, (laughs) because the Bible is history. But prior to that, there was some Babylonians that came, and one of the previous kings of Judah started showing the princes of Babylon their inner, inner secrets. Started showing them the inner chambers of the treasurers that Solomon and David had built. Can't always show and tell. (laughs) And so that word had gotten, and so Nebuchadnezzar, who was his father's chief uh, war strategist, and he's out doing campaigning, he had some major losses to the Egyptians. Now at this point, he had marched down in 605. He came against Israel. He goes in and takes some stuff, and he takes some, some of the people in the deportation. Now, Babylon is going after the pattern of the Assyrians, that when he conquers a place, they're not wanting to eradicate it. See, the Hittites and the Havitites will go into a city. They don't care anything about keeping in the good, the bad. They wipe everything out. But the Babylonians wasn't that. They were a philosophy, and the, the Greeks did this too, of Hellenization, the world, and they wanted everybody to come under the hospice and the thinking of Babylon. They wanted the Babylonian culture and its god Marduk and its son Nabu to come in and everybody to think like them. And so what they would do, they deported folks from a nation that they conquered back into Babylon, leaving some here. Once they would train them, they would then send them back into that town to sort of make everyone think like a Babylonian thing. And so in 605, this happens. Now also what happened is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's father died. So he goes and he's becoming king. Now in 605, the first deportation is when a 15-year-old boy named Daniel is deported. He was one of the first ones. Babylon, for the next 20 years, is going to have its eye on Israel. Now, what happens is he told Jehoiakim, all you've got to do is pay me taxes and I'm going to leave you alone. Jehoiakim hears that the Egyptians had beat the Babylonians in a few little skirmishes with heavy losses, and they went to the Egyptians and said, would you protect us from the Babylonians? Now, the reason I'm telling you this is not to just give you information in history, but to tell you that the prophet of God, Jeremiah, told the people of God, you bow your knees to the Babylonians. So what Jehoiakim's doing is not just a political move. He's going against the word of God. 
Jeremiah. He throws Jeremiah in prison. He goes and seeks help from the Egyptians because he heard they skirmished off the Babylonians. And in that self-pride thinking, ah, I told you, man of God, we'll not do anything with the Babylonians because the Egyptians have our back. Meanwhile, Nebuchadnezzar, they said he wasn't quite five foot five. So he had a complex, but he had a major war strategy. He was very brutal. When he, when he turned, you know, when he turned his eyes on you, he's coming to get you. And so when Jehoiakim quit paying tribute, he goes and takes Jehoiakim, has him killed, drug through the streets, and he throws another king in, Zedekiah, his uncle, and says, all you got to do is pay taxes. This is around 597. In 597, the second deportation, he takes some more Jews. And says, Zedekiah, all you got to do is pay taxes. Well, Zedekiah, he did, he done the same thing Jehoiakim did. Babylonians come a few years later and surround the city for 30 months. Zedekiah tries to lead through some underground tunnels. They catch him. Let me tell you how Nebuchadnezzar was. They bring him to Nebuchadnezzar. This is also in the, it's only chronicled in the Bible, but well, in the Babylonian stales that they, he murdered the sons of Zedekiah in front of Zedekiah, and then he plucked his eyes out. And that's the last thing he's seen and threw him in prison. And so this comes to where we find ourselves in our text. Fast forward to 586. Nebuchadnezzar sends 300 mules loaded down with axes and various things, and they burn the city down and destroy its walls. They melted Solomon's temple down because it was made primarily of gold. And Lamentations tells that destruction. So I'm saying all of that to say two different things. Number one, when it says, And God gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand, this was not an overnight process. God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet after word to God's people. God sent them word after word after word, and they would not hearken. God in return in captivity is going to do some things. See, God's that type of God. God's a gracious God. Matter of fact, it's in Babylon because Nebuchadnezzar wanted to rebuild Babel. That was his goal to rebuild the Tower of Babel and to bring all of humanity back together. So he was bringing all these different people and then bringing all of textbooks and libraries and he built museums and Gar, he was a great builder and he was trying to rebuild and connect the world again. But what he was doing is he established because in captivity was born a guy named Ezra from the tribe of Levi. And in captivity, Ezra was trained how to read, how to study in the libraries, and he started putting together what we call the Old Testament. And we have the Old Testament because God had all of that stuff brought there, then used a ready scribe that you can find in the book of Ezra, who didn't waste his time, but he put all of that together. And when Ezra left 70 years later, he brought a copy of the canon of the Old Testament. They call it the Masoretic Text the Old Testament. So that's a little bit of the more information of God having mercy where it seems. And so was part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. Let me say a little bit about that. The tale of two gods. So Jehovah was the out and on of the God of Israel. Marduk was the God of the Babylonians. He had a son named Nabu. They had a temple built to him, and he brings some of these vessels. He, me, and Nebuchadnezzar bring some Jewish vessels out of the temple of God and establish them there. And basically what he's telling the world is, my God is bigger than yours. And don't you ever forget it. Because his vessels are sitting in the temple. So this was a religious act. This was an act of worship by Nebuchadnezzar to a false god. Marduk. You say, how do you trace that? I can't trace a lot of these false gods down. Marduk, Baal, Astra, all these. Listen, it's just paganism. It's gods after men's own making. I mean, they make these gods and put them up and then they worship them, knowing they made them. (laughs) 
I love that song. We serve a God who was not made with hands. And not knowing what the world is saying, they're judging God's long-suffering and God's purpose plan with Israel, and they think that they're winning. See, a lot of times the world can think that they're winning because a lot of things is crammed and pushed, but the last sentence of human history has not been written yet. We're going to see that Daniel understood some things about God. It's the reason he could do what he could do while he's there. If you think I'm going to be preaching messages like dare to be a Daniel, and this book's about Daniel, I used to do that stuff, but then I realized this book's really not about Daniel. It's all about Daniel's God. (laughs) And when you understand correctly about who God is, we all can have the faith of Daniel being in exile. And so, Nebuchadnezzar, was that type of king with his palaces, with the Istar Gate. I had one picture. It showed the Istar Gate. So what happened in five, nine, or, uh, 1890, the Germans was the first ones to go in and archaeology excavate Babylon. And they take the Istar Gate and they assemble it. It's now in Berlin. For about 30 years, the Germans brought all of this out. So most of world history that we know about Babylon's come from the Germans. Uh, And yes, Adolf Hitler got a hold of that history and tried to pattern himself. I'm short. He's short. I'm crazy. He was crazy. I'm going to take the world over. I'm going to take the world over. And seriously, a lot of that was his mindset. And it was a lot of the paganism and into the dark magic, into the Marducks and to the Nabus and to the same type of things. Uh, it's the same thing. So uh, you see in world history that man repeats himself. But God has purpose and plans that he's bringing to fruition. Verse number three, it says, And the king spake unto Apanaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored, they had good character, skillful, in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge, understanding sciences, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, in whom they might teach in learning uh, the language of the Chaldeans, the culture of the Chaldeans, and the king appointed them daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nursing them for three years. So he sending them to school for three years. Most master's programs was three years. <clears throat> Matter of fact, Oxford, Cambridge, a lot of universities uh, are three-year programs, and actually it's based after the school here in Babylon. Let me give you a few things, because <clears throat> I'm not going to get into Daniel's and the three at this point. Next week, I'm going to break them down. This culture is trying to change identity, right? How to have integrity into those things. And they change their name. And they're going to, the first thing they're going to do is change Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, right? Get their names changed. I could imagine some of the young people sitting around and saying, what's your name? Daniel, Daniel, where'd you get that? Because all names is after God. And remember, the Babylonians didn't rename everybody. They only renamed the ones that they're training. And they, tr- and they would rename them after a Babylonian god. And so we'll take a look at that next week. But I want to give you, by way of practical truth this morning, not just give you some history of setting the stage where we find ourselves around 605, the first deportation, the first seven verses, a 15-year-old and some other young people being jerked out of what they know thrown into exile. <clears throat> Daniel never returns to uh, Israel, never said that he ever seen his family again, and was jerked from that environment. Now, if you're young, and I'm thinking, if you're jerked from that type of environment and thrown into that environment, there's some things you better have settled before you get there. So I'm hoping you as young people are settling some things in your life. Because if all you are is wanting to be a social media influencer, you're going to, you're Christian, you're going to be turned upside down. If all we do is have time and we've got cricks in our necks because all we're doing is looking down and can't find the time, we need to get into the truth of God's Word. <laughs> we need to get into what really matters and impacting folk. 
I want to credit our young people. I've got the, this, this mission that's just laying upon me. And I mentioned it Wednesday night of, you know, hope for Hilltop, a community right here within the shadows of this church, the Hilltop community. Our young people went over there Wednesday night, and they was telling me. One come up and said, man, we was there. We got to lead a young man to the Lord. <laughs> So there a young person who's got led. And we're going back next Sunday, by the way. If you want to know what that's about, we'll come out 5 o'clock next Sunday and we're going right back over there. This thing's about outreach. This is just the building. You and I are the churches. We need to get out of our mind that people's just going to flood in here. God told us to go ye, therefore, with the gospel. And we're going to take the gospel and we're going to go ye, therefore. Because <laughs> we love some folks and we got some truth. And we want our young people to see that there's some folks that struggle. And to get some stuff now grounded in their life. Because trust me, there is those coming after their minds and hearts. Trying to get them early. I want to tell you, if we could just understand, Nebuchadnezzar is just a picture of you fast forward into into the Antichrist, but it's just a picture of who's controlling them all, which is the devil. He despises anything holy, anything innocent, and the younger, the better. The devil is a tyrant. You just look, you say, how could this happen with you? The Sound of Freedom is a movie that goes on, and I'm preparing some stuff on that. I know we want to stick our hands in you know, in sand and not face some things. But there's some things that's going on, not only in other countries, it looks very different here in America, and it's flooding our streets. You say, who's behind all of that madness and all that craziness? It's the devil. It's the devil. He doesn't care about any, what damage it does. That now a child's going to live, the rest of it doesn't care about any of that. He's out to damage them that they never come to God because he knows 90% of the time when something negative happens to a young person, they blame God. He knows all that stuff. And so as we look and think, there's some things we need to instill. There's some truths to instill. Listen, there's some things, young people, that the world can't give you. (laughs) I mean truth and sound mind and peace. And so Daniel had some things that he knew about. God, I want to share them with you, just a few. First thing he knows is Daniel upholds that God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. When you read Daniel chapter 4, in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar shouting out that God rules over the affairs of the kingdom of men. In Daniel chapter 1 as well as chapter 2, one thing Daniel continually says is that our God is in control of all human events. He knew that at 15 years old. (laughs) The reason that he was able to go, and the first thing he's faced with was a king's palace and treatment like this and to eat this and to change this. And If you'll just go here, everything's going to be easy. What made this 15-year-old say, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to eat that? You can call me what you want to call me, but my name is Daniel. And I'm here because I know that God is sovereign over the affairs of men at a young age. And you don't have to be a theologian to know that. You just got to have the faith the size of a mustard seed that we serve a God without human making. He's a sovereign God. He's in control. He's calling the shots. And you can put all of your confidence, both feet planted firmly in our God that he's in control. So Daniel was able not to judge his circumstances and get caught up in himself and why me, God, why me? That's most Americans. That's probably what I'd been doing. God, I'm 15. I want a baseball scholarship. That was always on my mind. I'm getting ready to go. Why would you do this to me, God? Why would you do this to me, God? Probably what I'd have been doing. Then I'm living a bitter life the rest of my days can't have no relationship with no one, mad at everyone. This happened because I was here, or this happened, or this abuse, or this, or this abandonment happened. Never understanding that God can use things in our lives that literally transform. And so Daniel knew early. I don't know how his parents taught him that. I reckon it was just line upon line. <laughs> Number one, I guarantee his parents lived that truth. <laughs> So they live what they say. And if they were living it, they were teaching them things. 
Let me tell you some things about God, young Daniel. Now get, get over it. Now don't do that. Don't smack your brother. Come here. Come here. He was just normal, living everyday life, but the father was feeding into him. Every now and then he'd get mad and have to leave the room. <laughs> no, we're not giving you candy right now. Listen to what I'm telling you. <laughs> He's a God who was not made with hands. He's a God who made a promise to our father Abraham. He's a God that when he says something, it shall be complete. And nothing can happen to you that God doesn't allow, and he'll bring you through it. Daniel, don't worry about the kingdoms. Don't even worry about the king Jehoiakim. Boy, we start fighting over a lot of this stuff, don't we? We start fighting over, are you part of this party, part of this party, part of this? I'm telling you, God supersedes every bit of it, and I'm a Christian first. God raises up kings and he brings them down. God brings up rulers and he brings them down. You mean God rose up me, Nebuchadnezzar? God rose up Nebuchadnezzar. And by the way, tells me in Jeremiah 27, 6, that Nebuchadnezzar was the servant of God. Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. And he didn't even know it. We talk about puppet and vassal kings. Everyone is playing to the drumbeat of the sovereignty of God. And that was imprinted in this young man's life. He knew it. And so young people understand that God is in control. Despite what you see. Boy, I hate to be young, being in your age. No, you're in the perfect time to be a teenager. This is the perfect day to be living. Now, I love our seniors. But it seems like the older you get, the more dire we get, Right? Well, when I was a kid, I just remember it wasn't like... Well, there may be some truth to some of that. But what I can tell you is the Bible says that each one of us are called to serve God in our generation. And God gives people what they need to face what they need while they're there. And to do the right thing and to carry the light and the gospel during the generations in which they are lived. And so we see that Daniel has exactly what it takes to be part of those that was deported to Babylon, because God's going to use him to be alive. Number two, Daniel teaches that Christians can go into exile, but God never does. God never leaves the throne. He never exiles from the throne. He's always in charge. Don't judge your circumstances and try to put that on God. God's always sovereign. He's always there. Because in exile, I told you before, if you're not careful, you're going to get despaired. God, I don't want to be here. Well, God may be doing some things in your life. Daniel was there not on his own making. Daniel knew stuff about God. He was a Christian young man. You see that his character that stood. So really, he's there not based on his choices, but the choices of the nation and their leaders. You know, sometimes our national leaders can make choices and put us in some tough places. What are we going to do? Cry out about that or cry out to a God that supersedes all of it? And trust God's plan, that God's bringing us here. We may not see the end of the story, but God's in control. Even in exile, if you don't know that God is working in your life, working in your marriage, you may be feeling exiled in your marriage. You may be feeling different things in life in this season that you're in. Don't give up hope. Don't go to despair. Don't get bitter. Another thing I'd have probably done, I've been looking to sucker punch every Babylonian I could. I'd get them <laughs> and just hate and be mad and know Daniel wasn't that. See, Daniel didn't retaliate on his captors. See, only God can give that. I told you before, some of my greatest people in history, George Lyle, the black preacher of the slaves, one of my greatest guys. If I could go back, to a point in history. Well, I'd like to see some things, and, and I got some Bible stuff I like to go back to, but I'm talking about just in history. I like to go back and sit under and listen to George Lyle preach. Oh, I would love to just sit underneath that one time. Why? Because God's able to take men and women in circumstances they didn't choose to be there, but rise above it and become the very solution in the situation. Only God can do that. So Daniel teaches us that while we can go into exile, our God does not. And he can give you what you need when you need it. Thirdly, Daniel's faithfulness in the many little things prepares him for the few big things. 
You know, Daniel only interpreted two dreams. We act like that's all he said around and done. <laughs> was dream, dreams and vision. He just did two. <laughs> no, the, the key to Daniel's life is every little day in the little things. As a man, as a pan, the chief of the eunuch seen something different in him. As a riot, seen something different in him. In the little things in life. Listen, it's the little foxes that will spoil you, but it's the little things that you're faithful in. Going great things for God is just being faithful in the little things. Just the little things, how you treat your neighbor, how you treat your wife, how you treat your, how you handle your anger, how you handle that person. The little things every day. Can you imagine if Daniel was bitter, would not have stood and been faithful in these little things, but knowing that God was sovereign, brought peace to us. I'm not saying that he enjoyed, boy, I love being stripped from my land and being thrown. It's not that. Daniel wasn't weird. No, but he had God in him that gave him the ability, even when he was in an uncomfortable state, to live out the truths of God. And God rose him to be a chief leader and advisor to two different nations, the only one to ever do that. So be faithful in the little things. It's the little things. And then when the big things come, you're going to be able to make the right choice. How do you know that you're going to be in God's will 10 years from now? You do the little thing to be in God's will today. <laughs> you remember, you can't live 10 years from now. You can't live tomorrow. But I know if I do the little things today, it is making me step forward to tomorrow. And there's only one or two big things that's going to come your way. Two big things. It's going to be life transformational, but you're not going to be ready for them if you're not being faithful in the little things. He was faithful in the little things, and he gained this confidence. Now get this. When we get to chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he gets all the wise men, including young Daniel, who's a teenage boy. I'm going to kill every one of you, and here's what you got to do. Interpret my dream. Well, what is it? I don't remember. So not only you got to tell me what I dreamed, you got to tell me what it meant. And everyone went to hiding, crying, calling everybody, sending a call. I'm sorry, I loved, loved you. Not, it, it was good what lasted, but I'm about to die. <laughs> but Daniel told Azaphan, take me to him. Because I got a God who knows these things. He had confidence in God that when the big moments came. But it wasn't that he was part-time and he was faithful in the little thing that prepared him for the big moments. Daniel lastly gives us prophecy. God is bringing his purposes to pass. His plans are happening. Matter of fact, he comes and tells uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you think you're here by accident? No, sir, my God put you here. You may have some vessels sitting over in the temple, but just like uh, us nowadays, you know, we if someone puts something, you know, if someone moves something in the church or a vessel, you don't think, people's crazy about vessels in the church. Just move something. Touch that picture. Move that plate. Move that pillow. <laughs> Listen, I love the world, I love you. But that means nothing. <laughs> that means absolutely nothing. You say you're disrespecting. I'm not disrespecting one person who's gone on and was faithful to God. But I'm telling you, what they did was not just about vessels. It was loving him every day and instilling. That's what I appreciate our forefathers. Not that it was some little vessel. And God was showing them the power is not in these vessels. The power uh, wasn't in the menorah. The power wasn't in the Ark of the Covenant. You remember when the Philistines come and they took the ark and Israel's like, how could they do that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you why there's no power in it. It was just a gold box. What gave it power was the presence of God. It's God's presence on things. And so what this is showing us that God is bringing things to pass. It's his presence is moving in and don't judge a book by its cover. And so Nebuchadnezzar, you're, you're not here by accident. God raised you up. Matter of fact, when he had another dream by the statue, he said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar said, yes, I am. <laughs> he loved that. And then he began to tell him the next 600 years of human history. Daniel began to tell Nebuchadnezzar, this is what's going to happen over the next 600 years. We look back at it. It was so accurate that secular historian says there's no way that Daniel chapter 11 was written prior it had to have been written later. 
even though all points of antiquity points that Daniel was written and compelled by Ezra, way before the events ever happened. He told about the Medio Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great, the Romans, and even it branching into two different ones. All was in this book. It tells us about Jesus is going to come as a Messiah. Daniel chapter 9 is the 70 weeks. Wait till we tap into that. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is the movement of world history. Nothing catches God off guard, even the little things in your life. Yes, there's world history happened at a big level, but in your little world, we serve the same God who cares about the little things that's happening in your life, and none of it catches God off guard. If you're here and you're seeking something, you've got a God of all glory that says, I'm here to give you exactly what you're needing. <laughs> you need comfort, you need love, you need peace, you need joy. You need God to come in and infect your marriage. You need God to help relationships. You know God cares about that. And he can bring things into your life to pass. And this prophecy that Daniel gives lets you and I know. See, God did that. We know that six, seven hundred years of history was point on. You know that Daniel gives the history from, uh, and the future from where we are right now, even going on into the eternal future, Daniel tells us, you say, what's going to happen? Well, stick around. I'm going to share with you. <laughs> Where I get my eschatology is not from Revelation. It's from the book of Daniel. And when I understand the book of Daniel, Revelation makes sense. And so what a God we serve. That we serve a God that we're not just floating through the air. You were created with a purpose. There's a plan in your life. And man, what's going to yoke you up and what you're looking for is not a thing. It's not the next thing you can buy. If God blessed you in that area, it's not the next vacation. What it is, it's finding your purpose because who God loves is people. And how can you impact people in your life, bringing them to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? And the only reason you can do that is because you're gaining the knowledge of who Jesus is in your own life. And that's bringing a sense of purpose into your life. And it's causing you to be salt and light in a world that desperately needs it. That's what the Daniel's about. That's what Daniel knew. As we start breaking down some things, Daniel knew these things. And we got the enemy that's fighting tooth and nail against every bit of this. And so in conclusion, our God reigns. Our God is faithful. You're here by design and by purpose at this stage in your life are, where you find yourself, and God's wanting to give you so much purpose and joy worth living. You say, how can I find it? When you get a hold of the life of Christ and get a hold of what his life for you is, it's exactly what you're looking for. You won't even have to change what you're doing for a living. You're doing it with a different mindset. <laughs> That's the type of God we serve. So what we're offering you here is a connection with the Lord Jesus Christ what we're going to share you about. If you've never trusted him, I pray that you'll put your trust in Jesus, which is what this whole Bible's about. It's what the book of Daniel's about. It's Jesus in history coming and making a difference when he died on the cross, giving you us and I hope that goes beyond this life, but purpose and destined where God has taken us throughout all eternity. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your faithfulness. <clears throat> thank you that no matter what we bring in here this morning, whatever chain may be us down, whatever bondage, wherever we find ourselves, maybe it's the bondage of our thinking, maybe it's some things that happened to us while we were young. We just feel an exile. Just don't. I pray, God, that you will speak to our lives, that you're right, you're sovereign, you got a promise to speak to each life here this morning. And maybe it's the first time that you're opening the ears and hearts up. I thank you for your kindness and for the great hope that is found in the word of life, the word of God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask it in Christ's name. Let's stand to our feet.